pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. <coughs> and this is Treadway, if you do the roll call, please. Tim Menninger? Here. Myself here. Brianna Schaumbauer? Here. Gary Dunlop? Here. Joe Gittins? Here. Cheryl Hancock? Here. Anita Jaginski? Here. And Kate Mayer? Here. Okay, with seven of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Approval of the agenda, I would note that the agenda had been posted and distributed, sent to local media. There was an amendment made by the appropriate deadline to add, include 7.2 middle school schedule. So with that in mind, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as published and amended. So, a motion and second. second. Any further discussion? Or any discussion, sorry. Um, seeing none, all those in favor of approving the agenda as amended, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. Motion carries. <coughs> Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. <laughs> I thought Ms. Yeah. Jumping right in there. Anyone? Okay, then we'll move on to reports and discussion. Uh, first, instructional services, art and world language self studies. Dr. Carlson and thank and, Wendy. Yep. As Wendy makes her way up, um, we are aware right. and we're working on, you have uh, issue paper included in your packet. You also have a copy, I believe, of the PowerPoint, um, <coughs> uh, at least a paper copy, if not already in the Dropbox <coughs> or sent to you. We are working and um, not, not handed out or provided to you at this time with the the full studies themselves. And so there's nothing you're going to be asked to take action on tonight. We will be getting those to you. They're 60 plus pages in length. And so we apologize for that. But I think uh, when you listen to, to Wendy, her overview will be very helpful then as you then go and take time with the studies once we get those to you yet tonight. Thank you. The self studies? They the are self. emailed right now. So if you have access to your email, they are in your email box right now. All right, thank you. Well, are the, are the teachers not presenting their self-study? They, some of them are here, but typically of our art folks were able to make it this evening. So well, oh. you'll have the opportunity to ask questions as well. Is that, I'm just, okay. I guess normally the faculty members present their self-study, so I'm a little confused. They are available, though, for questions. Yes. Our world language folks are, yes. Not our art self-study. They weren't able to make it. And is that kind of how it's going to be with self-studies from this point on? Is that our? I did present the self-studies last year, too. You so did? I wasn't here last year. I'm sorry. I was asked to do it last year, so I just okay. continued on with the tradition. Thank you. <clears throat> Anita, did you have it? Well, no, I just, I guess I would, I kind of, I don't remember, I remember you joining in, but I remember the staff members presenting their own self-studies, and I guess I would, I like hearing from the people who do the self-study and work in the department every day. Yeah, that is why I asked for them to come this evening. If and they're, they're sitting in the back of the room. They can come on up. Yeah, that would be good. Come on up. If you have questions, we will. I mean, she's going to show her self-study or the Okay. So just to review, our steps in our self-study process include first creating a description of our current program for the content area, and then the next step is a huge step, and that is where the team then studies their program and studies what else is out there as far as best practice. So they are required to complete a minimum of three, and the options are a survey results, achievement data, a gap analysis, an external evaluation, research review, benchmarking based on other schools, and a needs assessment. Tonight you will notice that both of our self-studies used 
the survey, the external review, and benchmarking against other schools and programs through their site visits. After that, then they synthesize the results, pull the results together, and determine what are the common themes in their results. And based on the common themes, they look at strengths and opportunities for improvement, and then make an action plan of recommendations based on our strategic objectives. So our world language is first, and our current courses at our middle school, you will see that they mirror each other. We have from the exploratory French and Spanish to French and Spanish three. And our courses at the high school, again, from French and Spanish one to honors French and Spanish with an addition of the courses that you approved in December, which are not included in their self-study at this time. So our world language teachers t worked very, very hard in creating a survey for our faculty, staff, administration, and students. They then visited our middle school world language instructors visited on Alaska and La Crosse, and our high school folks visited Stevens Point and Wisconsin Rapids, and they also used a retri retired teacher or instructor for their external review. Before I get to recommendations, I'd really like to talk about the strengths. And the world language folks have done a great job at making students aware and involves the students in a broader view of the world. Um, world language also allows students who have taken the required courses in middle school to place in a level two course at the high school. Students have an option of taking up to five levels and moving into youth options before they graduate from high school. The world language department regularly collaborates and not just at their building level but regularly 612. Um, the world language also they have <coughs> established learning targets and that guide their assessments and I think back to just earlier this year <coughs> when Brian presented on the French trip our students are given op opportunities to travel abroad uh, with French on even years and Spanish on odd years. And the world language curriculum is strongly aligned to the Common Core State Standards and the 21st Century Skills. So based on our strategic objectives, these are three of their recommendations for opportunities for improvement and they are to implement a consistent scope and sequence that completes the 616 World Language Program, offer dual enrollment at the 201 level, so that is at the UW systems at, within our own high school, and then offer advanced courses for high school students in levels two through four. Aligned to our communication strategic objectives, it's educating parents and community members about the importance of world language, making connections with local businesses, and creating that partnership for our students to be ready for post-secondary and careers, and to create testimonials on personal experiences in regard to world languages. As far as fiscal responsibility, to purchase document cameras for in the classroom, and purchase suitable headsets with microphones. Our fourth strategic objective about improvement capacity, finding a way that our world language teachers can be members of their local state organization, Waffled. So before we move on to art, if you have questions about world language, I would ask you ask our folks in the in the audience to join us so do you have any questions questions 
Um, yes, I do have some questions. I have a lot of questions. Since last time we heard from our global <clears throat> language rep, there were some things that we asked for, I think, as a school board that I'm not sure we have received yet. Like, how do we compare to other districts at middle school and high school? Um, that, that's important to me because I know that just even having been at the WASB convention and talking about global languages, things are moving and they're different than they used to be. <clears throat> Doesn't necessarily mean they're better, but they are questions that I have that I'd like to have answered. Um, and how, how do we as a district decide which way to go? for middle school, high school kids. Um, I know that, I so agree. I remember, Ryan, we were talking about middle school philosophy. I so agree that kids don't always know what they need at middle school. I, I so get that. But I also get that there are many kids in this year that do get mm -hmm what they need and I, I just kind of wonder about I mean I don't see any answers in this presentation about those questions that we had before yeah. um, so. and I, I maybe we aren't going to answer them tonight but I do want an answer sure. to kids like um, that really do know they want to take a language they want credit for it they're they can do that they have the support for it in middle school what are we doing for those kids so um, so in I guess I go back to, um, I'll, I'll just start with that first question. Where are we compared to other districts with so our programs? In, in your appendix, there are comparisons to, so in the self-study document. So we have document, some differences, right? There is comparison. There's comparison to ones that are different. Could you talk about those just for our studio audience? I what do, those differences are? I do not are? remember them all off the top of my head. I do not. Do you? Well, hello there. Hello. <laughs> uh, based on what we, we did with the research, we, we looked at the other schools in the MVC just to see, because basically the high school programs are the same. They offer level one, two, three, four. Some <coughs> offer five, some offer AP. Um, so what we had to look at is really what kind of a middle school structure, because in terms of FLES, which is elementary learning, we have Northern Woods. Um, and that's a whole different ball game when we get from K-12. Yeah. So then we looked at the middle school and, and it's, it's quite a variety of different programs that are set up. What we noticed, what really stuck out for us, is how those programs are set up within the middle school to allow for students to complete basically a level one learning sequence. And then when they move into the high school, they can begin at level two. Thus, schools that are on an eight period block or eight period day that's why they can offer up to level five or AP because those students that come in as freshmen take level two, as sophomores take three, juniors take four, and then as seniors take either AP or an honors course. When, when you really look at the data, it comes down to Sparta and Holman are the only two districts that have it where students who start can get so far within a curriculum sequence and then have to start over. So we do allow students to place out, but they have to take it one semester in seventh grade and both semesters in eighth grade. I, re I remember talking about this. Which is an option. A few months ago, the start over factor to me, uh, I'm, I'm just talking as a parent, if my daughters had done so much work and they had to start over, I would find that so frustrating. It's just an issue. I want to talk more about and I and I just don't see it in tonight's presentation I don't know if that that problem has been addressed Wendy do you think it has well and maybe Ryan can help too I don't miss your second question was about students that really want to take a world language course that option opportunity is there no, for my, them. I think my biggest question is the start over thing and Which I, mean, I know is not every student, but it is some students. And I, um, and again with Ryan too. I, I hope you know how much I understand and love the middle level philosophy. 
I'm just worried about those start overs and how frustrating as a as a former teacher, if a kid goes into my class and they're doing everything I am, everything I'm teaching, they're doing it over again. I believe, though, the that, courses that you approved last time were to take, to end the start over. So I think the start over they was were, and yet we care. also asked to have alternatives brought forward. So I'm not sure if we. Yeah. I, I just, I'm not sure what you mean by having alternatives brought forward. Well, my question is, if we ever have any student in Holman who is starting over, and maybe they're spending six to nine weeks doing the same thing they did once before, I guess my question is, how come? Which they shouldn't be now with the courses that were approved last time. There shouldn't be the start over because they have the one one A and one B to go into to avoid that start over. So they're picking up where they. So nobody in high school is doing over what they did in middle school, is what they, you're saying. They should not have to after the courses that were approved last time, unless they don't test out. Correct. But that was a the test out was in place before you know and that wasn't something I believe you guys said the test out would go away with your proposal so that would be that more person doesn't um, succeed in that exam then they they should be taking that course over in my belief to, to give them a bigger base right yeah if they don't test out right. I, I don't maybe I'm just confused here I, I felt like there was something going on in middle school that kids were taking that somehow when they went to high school they were retaking am I confused about that well I think that Tell was me yes it, and I'll just be that quiet. was the rationale behind but the courses that were proposed last time so that kids would not have to start back at point a they could either start at the mid one or the but my question is, do we have kids going into high school retaking something they took in middle school? They should not have to at the new courses. Ever? No. And I think Ryan wants to. I, okay. Did you have something? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought maybe you had something to add to that. Well, is there a comparison between what's offered in the middle school, make it identical? To something being offered at the high school and that seems like a waste of time. I think the thing that, that you have to, to think about when you're looking at these applied classes though is that they are looking at exposure to many of these applieds and so it doesn't matter what applied class they're going to be taking, that material that they're taking is, is beginning to build their base for one, what they think they are going to be interested in and then being able to decide from there how they want to move forward and what they want to expand upon and so I think that you have to look at those middle school applied classes that there are items that they are going to go back and revisit in those classes but I think that that's learning in general as we're looking at it that they are exposed to those things and as they move to that next level then there, there may be material that, that is repeated and that they expand upon and move further forward with. I think you're going to see that with not just world languages. I believe you'll see that with all applied classes that students are taking. Do you, do you think, though, that there are some kids, as we differentiate, that do need the opportunity to have more than just building a base? I guess I'm asking that because I do. As I look at all of our kids, for the most part, most middle school kids need to build a base. But I also know that there might be some that have gone beyond building a base and they're ready for something more. And I, I'm just kind of wondering, what do we offer them? I agree with you. 
-hmm. And that's those students that would take a semester in seventh grade, a semester and two semesters in eighth grade, and then have the opportunity to take that test and the opportunity to pass that test, which would then allow them to, is the right word, um, skip a level at high school start at level and two. start at level two at the high school. So that is available for those students to, to do that. They can drop out though, they can stop, right? They have the opportunity to, to choose to take one semester in seventh grade and one semester in eighth grade. So and if they would do that at that point, then they would not be able to take that placement exam. All right, is, is what we're talking about like commitment? So what I'm talking about is there is no opportunity to commit. No, there is opportunity to commit. There is. Definitely. Mm -hmm. When those students are filling out as seventh graders that they've been exposed as a seventh grader, um, they, they have that opportunity at that time to commit to taking two semesters in eighth grade for their applied classes. So they, they definitely have that opportunity. That's one of the items that we tell them when they're going home to talk with their parents about those applied classes and for parents to talk with them about, you know, as a middle school student, they may say, you know, I don't know if I want to take this and that may be where a parent is able to have that conversation with them about this is what we think is important. Other questions? I just have a clarification. In the last slide that you had up where the, the staff were provided financial support, I'm assuming you meant that our staff were given financial support to attend the conference. Is that correct? We, we did pay for it this year, but as a whole, you know, buildings don't always have a p m money to fund everybody to go. So. No, I think that's great. I just, the way it was worded, I was confused on whether they provided support or they were provided they were the provided okay. Okay. Um, okay. The staff may I interject, provided. Thank you. May I interject for just a moment yes. Wendy was gracious enough um, to pick up our Thursday part of our conference um, through her budget this year because it dealt with um, the core common core standards um, normally um, every principal we've been blessed with at the high school has allowed us to spend part of our budget money to go um, I receive my registration fees from Waffled, which is our conference thing, because I am the editor for our statewide magazine. And so um, I don't know if Brian gets any benefit from being in the French Association, but our principal has backed us every single year and has never said, no, it's not worth it. So each principal that we've been blessed with has, has gotten, gotten on board with us to give us that financial backing. We just want to continue that. Thank you. I just so Wendy will be getting the, the comparables to the other schools you said in the in the it, appendix it is in the self-study okay it would it, and I don't know if that was an oversight it would have been really helpful to have that while we're looking at this in our board packet I don't know if that was omitted by accident or I don't know what happened but yeah. I was kind of surprised because usually when we get self studies to look at they're really a big huge document it's an all weekend mm -hmm. thing to page through and there was really just an outline, and I was like, am I missing something? Did something not go into the Dropbox? I didn't know. No, I apologize so. for that. That was me. I was out of the district three days last week and sent it from Madison and okay. didn't even think about it. Is that um, something then, we'll get then eventually? It's like, in your mail it's now. It's, in, it's, it's here now if I went to it. I would see how in we compare. In your email. So we, let and then me. I, need, I want to ask also. Yes. I, just, I guess I would just ask the... Um, a couple of the or whoever in the staff in the world language department what your ideal what your ideal world language department looks like and I get I I too would like to say this is no offense to you I'm not used to you presenting I love hearing from the teachers who are in the classrooms doing this every day I would I prefer that that I'm just one of seven people up here but I do prefer that because I like hearing I, I like hearing from them directly I I do that's my preference it's just easier and it you see the passion in what they're telling us when it comes directly from them and I like hearing from you too because you're passionate about your subject matter but this is a middleman thing and I like to omit the middleman I like I, I hearing agree. right from them so <laughs> I agree that's why I've asked them to join me 
<laughs> so I guess I would just ask them within <coughs> current program what their ideal world would look like. Well, current program um, logistics with money and budgeting and everything like that, um, we'd like to see a, a six, seven, eight equal that first year so that they can all test out and be able to go over that first year. Um, one of the recommendations you'll see in there when you get it, um, it's been there for a while, is a K-12 program. Um, I did tell Dr. Carlson at the curriculum thing when he gets his next $2 million <laughs> that we would like to fund that. So, um, but with within budget constraints um, we believe that we could have a six seven eight that equals our Spanish one and French one at the high school on a test out program um, with the gap courses that were approved uh, a little bit of you know no one wants to give up their hundred percent teaching to drop down to teach a 25 percent course or 50 percent course um, so we do have a little bit fear there that those won't go because we won't have anybody to teach them so in an ideal world Somebody to teach those, somebody to keep the rest of us full time, and to have that six, seven, eight equal um, a level one, um, and those kids who choose not to go to levels, or, you know, um, the two semesters at the eighth grade level, that they would be able to get that stopgap course. And again, $2 million so we can put in the whole thing. I, you know, I don't I think it was a lot, Dr. Carlson. <laughs> Well, and I actually, the reason I like to see the self-studies, I always jump to the weaknesses. I look at those strengths, mm -hmm. let me tell you, but I always jump to the weaknesses and look to see then how have we address those. And it seems just briefly, quickly, that the recommendations that we have are a bit different than what were on the, um, the PowerPoint, but it did, and I'm so glad this is in this, it identified a weakness that the school district has a vision that states we will provide every student, help every student to achieve global success. And yet 60 some percent of our people in the, the surveys were saying that they felt there should be some elementary level. And I know the way that we budget right now is we cast forward and we identify some of those unmet needs, but really we just cast forward and we do what we can do, status quo what we've been doing for so many years instead of identifying what it is we should be doing and figuring out a way to pay for it. And this is one example of how we're not doing that. And it's unfortunate and it's not Wendy or any of the people who did this study responsibility. It's, it's the onus is on us to start thinking like that. Um, but so we look at that and we, some of the things you're talking about is the middle school situation and um, to have that be more consistent. I know even here it talks about 45 minute classes um, in the high school and it wasn't really addressed I don't think in the bullet points but is that something that we're looking at? I Again their recommendations and that's something that we have to go over with our principal. I mean uh, recommendations don't mean yay we get the whole thing with a big bow on it. Um, we're just saying that's our wish list for Christmas and through conversation with Wendy, with Bob, with Ryan, with Dr. Carlson, and looking at a vision that we can all agree on is what, is what we really want. Mm -hmm. um, we want to do what's best for our kids, which has always been our focus. We, uh, a number of years ago when Sandy was in Wendy's position, and we went to the PLCs, we asked for permission to do a 612 PLC so that we could indeed align the middle school with the first level of um, Spanish one or French one at the high school. And that made sense then to keep us all together um, because we'd all be working on the common assessments, um, the outcomes, so on and so forth together and then everybody would see the big picture. And that's what we're, that's what we're going for. And that global thing and now the um, dual credit, at, you know, 201 eventually still talking about that, working towards that so that that's something that as students move on and, and can get the college credits, not the same as youth options, um, can get that college credit by paying the college quote unquote tuition um, is a benefit, you know, but that takes aligning with the college professors for the people who are teaching the upper levels. Okay, and then um, I'll keep looking for my art part of it, so, but thank you. Um, and thank you all, because we're really proud of what we've put into this. It was a lot of hard work, but again, let me acknowledge, couldn't be done without Wendy's generosity. She funded the trip to Wisconsin Rapids, um, 
and the overnight stays so they didn't have to drive three hours back and three hours there. Mr. Bear for, you know, allowing them out of the building, allowing us all out of the building for our conference. So we don't get this done by ourselves. And poor Ryan having to try and figure out his schedule and our schedule. And we're just very grateful for everybody involved. So thank you for everything that you do consider us for. And you should take those strengths and really focus on those and be complimented on those too because you do provide a good good program at the schools throughout the school so thank you so do we want to move then on to on to art, art. I, I do want to move on but I also want to say I thank everybody who has a differing opinion I think that's what makes our school district strong and I'm not afraid of differences and I hope none none of our people are as well and and I still have unanswered questions about this but I'm willing to wait to see what the answers will be um, on the other hand um, I guess what I'm saying though is is that I sense that there are differing differing opinions about what the best program is and that's okay to have differences and for us to talk about them I'm not afraid of that and I would like those to be brought forward to us as a board Super. So our art, this is just a general overview. All elementary students participate in art and K-5. And then at the middle school level, six, seven, and then there's a couple options at eight. And our high school folks were very creative. This is in their self-study. <coughs> And with the work that they put into it, I thought it was a great opportunity to see the different types of art courses that they do offer and the, I guess the topics, but then the courses underneath each of them. They too created or did a survey of students, staff, faculty, and administration. Elementary educators visited Irving Perch in on Alaska and Summit Elementary Environmental School in La Crosse. Middle School visited Lincoln Middle School in La Crosse and West Salem Middle School and High School visited West Salem. They too had a external evaluation completed by a retired teacher who came in and met with focus groups and then visited each of the buildings to learn more about their program some of the strengths that they found when they put all their data together that the curriculum is referred to and frequently utilized as a working document i know our elementary teachers have a wiki that they are constantly updating their curriculum and sharing materials back and forth they collaborate frequently not and also like our world language teachers not just at their building level but they frequently collaborate k-12 student artwork is displayed throughout the building and the community right now is the art show at the pump house so if you haven't been there it's a great time to celebrate our students the art staff is flexible and works well with all other content areas and they have strong parent communication via newsletters then their recommendations include elementary offering a consistent delivery of curriculum at all elementary buildings middle school working on that scope and sequence for six through eight and high school creating a foundations level class at high school in graphic design animation photography and having those courses taught by an art teacher Um, their second set of recommendations based on our second strategic objective communication is elementary the monthly newsletter that each building sends out to create um, some news about what is happening in their buildings and both high school and middle school updating their department website monthly and then getting in touch with parents through their email or 
so that they can send newsletters or email. So fiscal responsibility, um, elementary level, to have building budgets be equal. And currently each building does a fundraiser to supplement and they've asked that, you know, whatever their budgets are that factored in or not, that they end up equal at the end of the day. Um, middle school to increase the amount per student to provide quality supplies and to match the growth of our student population. High school to maintain an increase of possible the budget per student. And all the areas expressed a need for technology, more the computers, laptops, smart boards, cameras, projectors, and screens for in their rooms. And the fourth strategic objective, improvement capacity, is also financial support to be involved in their organizations. So, and questions. Are there people here from the art department? In the future, when these reports come, I would like to have every single curricular chair represented. He coaches, so. And coaches and everything. Because, Wendy, I know it's, you yeah. can't. <laughs> you can't have all that stuff in your head. Um, and those are our experts. So I would just like, I don't know if we can make that mandatory or not, but it would be really good to have those. Um, those teachers here I think one thing that I quickly was looking over the self-study and I noticed an area financial of course where we are budgeting about three dollars and well, what is it three dollars and something compared to nine dollars more than nine dollars at West Salem just one of the visits that we did and I know that Again, it's a budgetary thing, but it is, and I haven't had a chance to go to the end to see if there's any research on others, if that's just West Salem has an extremely high budget for art. I know they've got a great program over there, but are there norms at the end of it in the where they Where the teachers wrote up in their site visits, they did ask and report upon it in each of their site visits, so. But beyond the site visits, I mean, because they only visited a couple schools. Yeah, no, they only did it the schools that they visited. Okay. Well, I need to take some time to look this over. But. Again, there are a good number of strengths identified. Oh, definitely. And I'm not sure if, though, the recommendations align with um, the recommendations, so we'll just, I'll just have to take some time to look that over but they should because I just copy pasted them okay. from the documents so okay. and then so there's no action on this this evening <clears throat> we'll, we'll get that out and again we I think the plan was to come back at the next board meeting but but um, based on questions and so on that can almost be the following board uh, not the next one as well if whatever the board's comfortable with so we would invite questions but we'll get that information out if you we can get hard copies as well we'll get it on the drop box eventually I know it's been emailed but some of you um, we can get a, a paper copy as well they're quite large but we can certainly do that okay all right thank you Wendy you're welcome and then Middle school schedule, Wendy and Ryan. Now you get to talk about the schedule. All right, good evening everyone. I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to, to come this evening and talk with you uh, about some changes 
that will be taking place with the middle school schedule. These changes have been something that we have been working on now um, as, a, as an entire staff for over a year. We've really taken a lot of time to look at many of the different details. And if there is definitely one thing that we have found out is that it is a puzzle and that when we're looking at this, um, as you change one thing, it, it definitely has a huge effect on the other. Um, I also want to let you know that um, I tried to put as much information here as I could, but if you're looking through this and you have any more questions, please feel free to give me a call or set up a time to sit down with me. I'd be more than happy to, to spend some time with you explaining anything that, that may not um, be clear in this presentation. So the first thing that we looked at is changes to instruction um, to meet the needs of the Common Core State Standards, and this was in the area of ELA. And that first area is, as you'll see, this year, um, sixth and seventh grade, they teach reading and writing as separate classes. And in eighth grade, reading and writing are being taught integrated into ELA. As we're moving forward, we will be making the change that in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, reading and writing will be integrated into ELA. This is something that we are making a change, um, as it says, to, to meet the needs of the Common Core and to really be looking at reading and writing as a process that needs to be done together. That in order to really understand that you need to be both reading and writing with those, with those together. As I said before, um, anytime you make a change in our building, it definitely has an effect. This year, our house structure um, for sixth and seventh grade is we have two houses with five core teachers in each house. Those teachers teach either ELA, reading, math, science, or social studies. As we move forward to 2013-14, the change is that we will be moving to three houses. Two of the houses will have four core teachers teaching ELA, math, science, and social studies. And then two core teachers will be in one house, making up a two-person house. And each of those teachers will be teaching two subjects. This structure is much like our eighth grade structure is right now. With this being done, um, within our staff, we did have to look at teaching assignments within our staff in order to make those changes for houses. Something that needs to be noted is when we made these changes, there was no loss of jobs, and there was also no addition of jobs to make these changes. As I considered looking at these assignments, some of the things that I looked at was license, licensure of teachers, implementation of the Common Core, team dynamics, previous experience, and fit within those teams and within those grade levels. This is the 2013-2014 um, house core teacher configurations. So as you will see on this document, there, is, there are three houses in each grade level. Um, and you'll see that in each grade level, there are two houses with four teachers. And there is one house with two teachers, each teaching two subjects. Teachers that did make, that I did make changes with um, are in 6C with Mr. Gilbert, will now be teaching ELA and social studies, and Ms. Johnson moved from seventh grade this year, and she will be in sixth grade teaching math and science. As well as in seventh grade, Ms. Dirks stayed in seventh grade. She will be teaching ELA and social studies, and Mrs. Nelson, will be in seventh grade only next year teaching math and science. So those were, were some of the changes that were made. And then on the bottom, you will see that I have Mrs. Koistinen, and she is in a position where I have her as an ELA interventionist. This is extremely important as we are looking at our RTI initiatives, and we're looking at our students as they're moving through that continuum, and we're realizing that they need more interventions and they need more help that this is giving us that availability to really try and work with these students when they get to a tier three intervention and to be helping those students. This is also something that we will need um, in order to move forward with our SLD criteria, which needs to come into place, I believe, by December of next year. So that's another piece that is able to fit in 
um, with this happening. At this point, I've, I've, I've given you a lot of information. Do you have any questions for me at this time? I have a quick question. Um, since you're combining reading and writing, will that hour be extended? Yes, it will. And I will show you that in just a second. That's an excellent question. <laughs> One thing that needs to be noted is that right now, um, we are looking at the house names of A, B, and C. We don't know if we're going to make changes to that, but it is something that is being brought up, and we are looking into it as a staff um, with some different suggestions for what those might be. As you know, um, no matter what suggestions come out, um, it's kind of like, as, as I'm seeing, um, naming a child, you, you <laughs> sure do find a lot of things that you say, ah, well, maybe not that. So we're working through it, and um, if we don't come up with something different, A, B, and C has served us very well in eighth grade. If we do come up with something different, I'm sure it will be extraordinary. They've been talking about changing those for 20 years. Yes. That's what I've heard. <laughs> so. Just very quickly, I want to talk about the process. As I started in the beginning, um, the first thing I have to say is thank you to everyone um, that is in the middle school that is on the scheduling committee. This group um, has been amazing. They have not been afraid to ask the difficult questions when they needed to be asked and to make us search for what we can do to be better. Um, all of those questions, um, it seemed that it always came back to student learning. And that was always the focus. And so I just have to say thank you to those people that are on the scheduling committee, as well as all the people that they reported back to within our school. This process began in 2011-12. In um, and along that time, um, we went to some professional development with Dr. Reddick. And he really helped us develop some parameters for creating a new schedule. I also want to say that we talked about the completion of the schedule to be January of 2013 and the completion of the teaching assignments for February of 2013. And we were able to meet both of those goals. And with a school that is our size and a staff that's our size, I think that that's coming together pretty well as a staff. And I'm very proud of our staff. Some of the parameters that were set for this initial schedule cre creation was looking at 60-minute course. Um, in previous, in previous the previous schedule um, in, in sixth and seventh grade, I believe it was 45 minutes that those cores were. So combining them together, we did add 15 minutes to that, um, as well as 15 minutes to every other core. As we looked at this, we thought it was very important to add that to the other cores, along with ELA and math, because of the disciplinary literacy that needs to be implemented in social studies and science. Um, their common course or their core standards should and hopefully will be coming out and with those, that increased rigor they're going to need that increased time as well. Um, this process was very much um, a process in which the scheduling committee would come together. We would develop some questions. They would go back to the staff and it was really a process of coming back together back and forth and through those ideas that were taken we were able to develop the schedule that we have um, and that we have created. Our new schedule does meet that timeline demand of 60-minute cores. It also meets um, the parameters of having a common advisory time for all grade levels. Um, right now, we're developing ideas for what that advisory time can look like in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, and whether or not that should be the same, or whether or not in those different grades we need to do things a little different to meet those different learner needs. We also looked at having a common academy time for all grade levels. This again comes back to RTI that I was talking about before and our interventions. We're also looking to increase our extensions for those students that want a little bit more. And this also gives us the availability to use our entire staff. Finally, this schedule has applied classes offered back to back. We have found that this is very important for our applied classes. Um, they're able to teach that same grade level back to back. Um, this helps with setup time. This helps with keeping them kind of in a rhythm as they are teaching throughout the day. <coughs> this also allows our PLC times for our other groups and our meeting times for those other groups to be extended a little bit more. Finally, this limits our transitions for those students from core classes and into these applied classes. And so this is the schedule that we have created for our 2013-2014 school year. As you'll see, advisory is the same. 
for all grade levels um, as that first time of the day. Um, something that I have noticed is when I'm standing outside at bus duty, you'd be amazed at how sleepy kids can look when they're walking into a building. But when they come out of an advisory, many of these kids are energized and they're much more ready to face the day. I think that that's important and that's why we did make one change. We did previously have one grade level that was not with an advisory at the beginning of the day and we did put that at the beginning of the day. Which grade level was that? Right? Eighth grade. Oh, okay. We also have all of our academy times at the same time at the end of the day. Um, you'll see that those times start at 2.06 and go to the end of the day. I think that this is important as well for those reasons that I stated before. You'll also see that for sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, those applied time periods all go back to back as well. Finally, you'll see that all of our cores have 60 minutes in all grade levels, which hopefully will allow us that time to meet the needs um, of those common core standards. It's been a lot. Do you have questions right now? <coughs> Eighth grade's eating a pretty early lunch next year. <laughs> yes, they are. Um, that is something that comes into um, the next slide as I look at. Um, we did many plus deltas um, as we, we looked at this schedule and created this schedule, um, and that is an early lunch. Um, although, um, talking with one of our teachers, um, children that get on the bus at 6 o'clock in the morning, um, although they can't have breakfast at school, um, that may not be the worst time to, to have that. Um, as you look at our day, starting at 7.35 and ending at 2.40, um, unbelievably that's very close to the middle of the day mm -hmm. for those kids. That being said, I'm not going to say that that isn't an early lunch. That is an early lunch for those students. I have been in contact with Mike Gasper. Something that we do not have right now is an afternoon snack and being able to offer an afternoon snack time for those students so that they would have something available for them at that time. We have had concerns expressed as well about students who are in activities at the end of the day and those students that do get hungry when they're in those activities. And we're trying to get outside the box as we look at different ideas to how can we help those students out to have that, you know, different snacks available for them at that time. I would say one of the biggest things that we can do for our students is continue to educate them on what it means to eat a healthy lunch no matter what time of the day it is. Many of our students um, don't always take advantage of what there is for a healthy lunch. Um, they may take all of the choices, um, but they eat very little at times. I think that one of the most important things that we can do for all of our kids is, is teach them what a healthy lunch is and, and how to eat that and how to get the most nutrition out of that lunch period. Um, for the people listening, can you, I know what this means, but could you explain what the cores are and what academy time is in a couple of sentences so that our parents know what that means because there are a few changes that are good changes mm -hmm. going on with that. The core classes um, for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade are ELA, math, science, and social studies. And then, did you ask me advisory or academy? I'm sorry. Academy. And the academy time, the academy time is our time where we can be offering interventions and hopefully offering more extensions. So our interventions are for those students in which data tells us that our students are not meeting benchmark. They are not, um, they are not meeting our expectations um, in the universal curriculum, so we need to offer them more help. When you hear extension, that might be those students who are getting what they need in that universal curriculum, and what can we do to extend for those students? Thanks. You're more than welcome. Thank you. No, I think, I think some parents, we have so many terms in education. <laughs> it's just like, what does that mean? So yes. How, how are the applied teachers with this schedule? Um, you know, I'm thinking middle school band. I've had children in that myself and watch some of these sixth graders come in barely knowing how to hold an instrument and I'm looking at 42 minutes for a period being somewhat short to try and work some of these kids through and a lot of times I see some of those applieds being shorted in, in these type of schedules and looking at their feedback on this I yep. guess. Um, this has been quite a process for us. The first schedule that came out um, actually had our applied classes at 38 minutes. Um, we, did a, we did some adjustment because it overwhelmingly came back from all staff saying, I just don't know if that's enough time 
for those students that are in those applied classes. Um, our applied teachers are, are very happy with the 42 minutes. Um, when we brought that to them, they, they had said that they think that is ample time. Um, I think they are like all educators. The more time they can have with their students, the more they know they can do with them. But our applied teachers, with that 42-minute block, um, I would say they were, they were pleased. I don't know if I want to throw the word happy out there, but they were pleased with what we had to offer with them at that time. And is this reducing the number of opportunities that students will have to take applied, different applied courses? That is an excellent question. And as I move forward, forward right. you have very well done. <laughs> Some of the schedule dynamics that, that we looked at are many of the things that we talked about. Um, but I, I want to say that when we were creating this schedule, we also looked at common passing times. And just very quickly, um, as you saw in that first schedule, having that core one for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade all at the same time is very important to us because we do have math that is offered where students can't accelerate in math. That gives us that opportunity for students to all take that at the same time. This is a good change for us um, because in that time period in our old schedule, there was actually an overlap for some of our students that went into their applied and we no longer have that anymore. So we were able to eliminate that overlap. We also looked at passing times. Um, as I was looking at the groups um, as I assigned the sixth grade, the seventh grade, and the eighth grade to schedule, I really tried to look at passing times and the number of students in the hallways at the same time. Students going from one end of the building to the other end of the building. Times when sixth graders and eighth graders would be in the hallway to try and avoid those same times. Um, seventh graders, they get along with just about everybody. They've, they've had experiences with the sixth graders and experiences with the eighth graders. But trying to make sure that between the eighth graders and the sixth graders that we are avoiding those times in the hallways just for all, for all students. Um, Lunch, we did talk about those times, and I also talked about working with the school nutrition program and looking at a breakfast for that group that has that late lunch and an afternoon snack for that group that has the, the early lunch. This is a change that we are looking at as well with our music performance classes. The music performance classes in sixth grade before were offered during the academy time at the end of the day. Um, that academy time at the end of the day in our current schedule I think is 35 minutes, I believe. Making this change moves the music into the applied time like music is in sixth and seventh grade. That is something that our music teachers were in support of. They think that this is a good idea. One of the reasons is any student that we do have in an intervention that student, it made it very complicated for them to be in a performance music class. By making this change, we do open that up and we make that easier for those students that are in interventions to be in the music performance class. This also gives them a, a longer period of time than they had in our previous schedule when that time was during the end of the day academy time. As always, there's, there's give and take when you make changes. Um, so there are no conflicts with our interventions anymore. They have a longer class period time. This also allows them to look at the possibility of having an academy extension, which they're very excited about for those students who really accelerate um, with their instrument or if they accelerate in that choir class. This does create a need for a choice in music. Um, as our numbers increase, um, we are looking at students and we are asking them that they need to look at band or choir in sixth grade. Because of our numbers and the way that this class is opposite of PE, that does, that does cause um, us to have to talk with students about making that choice. Um, there are possibilities for those students who are very interested in both of them that we are exploring about the possibilities of taking one one semester and one another semester. But in order for them to take them both, that does get very difficult um, just because of, like I said, that's opposite of the PE class, so you need to look at section sizes for classes that are offered opposite. But it's very dependent on that class size. So this is a major change. Do you have questions about this? When do individual lessons fall? During In, the academy time? 
individual lessons for students fall throughout the day. Um, and so... For, for the band, you mean? Yes. Okay. So I make sure you knew what I was talking about. Yep. They, they fall throughout the day. Our band and choir and orchestra teachers, they try and look at students' schedules and they try and schedule those with the students throughout the day. So a student may have their lesson on Thursday during, um, they might say, the last 10 minutes of core three and the first 10 minutes of their core four. How many? Has there been any consideration to making that change in any way, or is that even possible? I don't know that that's possible. Um, some students would be able to take lessons um, if, if they wouldn't do an extension during the academy time, they could look at possibly doing those lessons during the academy time. Um, but within the schedule for the day, that is really the opportunity for when those, those are available. It's ex I find it very, very difficult. My child finds it difficult to leave a core class to, to go to a band lesson. And while she loves band, she feels she can't make math soccer or whatever course she's in at that time. And it's very difficult for her to catch up, even if it is 10 minutes. So, you know, just a thought. How many students currently are in both band and choir that, you know, just are we talking a handful of students every year that this would be an issue, or is it quite a few? I, I believe we ran the numbers, and I believe it was 17 kids this year in sixth grade. Now, in seventh grade <coughs> and eighth, excuse me. <coughs> In seventh grade and eighth grade, um, the schedule is is a little bit different, so it does allow for that choice of for, both the choice for them both. to be involved. Yes, okay. and that that's always a little concern. Middle school, you know, they're still really forming what they want to do, and I I just hate to make them choose at such a young age when they may not know what their passions and and you know things are. So it's always mm -hmm. difficult. Yeah, that's when I started to say something before. That was going to be my comment. That would be that would be really difficult if you really are a music person and you have that's the way your brain works to make a decision between band and choir. It's too bad that you couldn't have like an A day where they're in band and a B day they're in choir and they alternate days like that and they could do both. That would that would really stink. But I understand. No, no, I, you know, I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah. I think it was one of the stumbling blocks to making this change a few years ago when they were going to be um, doing reading and writing within the, the curriculum. And that was one of the issues, I think, was that having to make a choice. It'd be nice if they could have both opportunities in sixth grade and then you know eighth grade is when they've usually have made that choice of mm -hmm. one or the other where sixth grade is the one you want to give them the but are there opportunities in the summer isn't there there's opportunities for band in the summer I know that but there are opportunities for band in the summer um, there's there's also opportunities for orchestra there, um, there are opportunities for right now, um, our show choir, uh, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Show choir was at Logan last Friday night. Um, and so I think that we're offering more of those opportunities. As we look at those extensions during that academy time, um, maybe we can look at those students who they might be in, um, they might be in a band class during the applied time, but they might join in in the, the choir portion if that is offered during, the, during that <coughs> extension time. Um, so I think that it's, go ahead. No, you finished. Sorry. I think that it's continuing to challenge ourselves to, to look for everything that we possibly can um, within that, uh, that time period that we have during the day. And then the, ba the lessons, whether it be instrumental or choir, vocal, uh, could those, are those ever done after the school day ends? I know before the school day it's pretty early, but... Is it possible to do that after the school day ends to have, especially if students are expressing that and feeling that um, do doubt I about? I think that we we do have we do have some students that take advantage of that, um, you know, that time before or after school. So we do have some students at the middle school. What is difficult about that is, you know, I don't think anybody wants to change the driving laws to allow middle schoolers to drive. It'd make it easier for us for a lot of things, but um, we'd depend on parents for that transportation piece. But a parent might be more 
like more interested in coming and picking their student up after school if that means they don't have to come out of their core courses one day a week or something. I'm gonna jump in here about the lesson um, issue. As a music student myself, um, I'm in the orchestra, and I know Mr. Birdsong works at both the high school and the middle school, and just knowing from experience how many students these teachers have to deal with and how many classes um, one person has to deal with, when they can fit you in their schedule is when you go no matter what and I mean they sit down and they talk to you and they typically say what time works best for you mm -hmm. so they are making an effort to schedule it at a time that's convenient for you and no it doesn't always work <coughs> out well but I think it would be wrong to ask these people to stay later or earlier when they already put in a lot of time I mean they work summer courses and they work just constantly and so it's um, I don't think this is as big as an issue <coughs> as we're making it. Even though it might be, it might bother some students and it might, um, it is frustrating. I know when I was taken out of classes for a couple minutes even, but sometimes you have to make those sacrifices to be involved with something. And I, music program. I think as well for those students, I always encourage those students um, to come and talk to, to me to come and talk to to their teachers, um, we we do have students that that will come and they will say, "Hey, listen, I'm I'm struggling right now in math. Is there a way that we could make this change and and making that change?" So, I think that if there's one thing that that we make a lot of is you know we we make a lot of flexibility possible within that schedule. So, um, definitely. I I think too that um, we make all kinds of choices available don't we yes incredible choices and with choice comes <coughs> some disappointment I choose a therefore I can't have B mm -hmm. and and that's kind of a part of life we can't allow choices a B C D E can we so when you make a choice you maybe negate other choices um, and yet through the courses of sixth, seventh, eighth grade, middle school is so unique, you know, and we have to be so sensitive <laughs> about our needs. We talked about the language. We've talked about all this stuff. Um, but once you make a choice, you maybe negate another choice. Mm -hmm. But maybe in seventh grade, you pick up that choice. That's what I think middle school is all about. And then you go to high school, same thing. You choose choir or you choose band that uh, part of that to me is life mm -hmm. having had five daughters they make choices <laughs> they can't have everything they want and I'm I'm just glad that we offer that you offer as much as we can to our kids and then their parents and them make those choices you figure it out um, continuing Continuing with some of those changes, um, something that, that was offered at the middle school, um, if, if you've had a middle school student, you've heard about minis. Um, and, and the minis, they allowed for exposure, but they also allowed for a lot of confusion. Um, as, as you looked at a sixth grader's schedule, it was very, very confusing for these students. These minis would change um, in the middle of a quarter um, it would throw these students off for three and four days. We would not only see this throw them off in their applied classes, but for, for a lot of them, they would be very worried in their core classes as well because something was changed when other students didn't make that change. And so in the past, we've had the, the minis, which have been for health, Spanish, French, tech ed, and general music. And then physical education, was taught with art and keyboarding opposite of that. As it says on the bottom, that was cumbersome. There were many changes at odd times, and it, it added to a lot of confusion. So what we have, have done is, by bringing that music into that, that applied time, we are we're able to offer that music. We continue with the physical education and the art across from the keyboarding, and then we have moved to four semester courses with world language as a split that I'll explain in, a, in just a moment, health, 
And then if they're taking general music, they're also taking tech ed. What we have worked on with our world language department is in order to offer that exposure for both of those classes in world language, we've worked with them so that what they're going to do is each of them will teach that course for that every other course for half of the time. And then what they're going to do is they're going to basically switch classes. And that's going to allow them that time to give those students the exposure to world language so that they are able to make that choice if they so choose in seventh grade to take either a world language or both world languages in, in seventh grade and still gives them those that time to to do that um, during that time for students that are in band and choir and orchestra they meet the dpi requirement for music in sixth grade so they do not need to take that general music and so they would not take that general music tech ed split um, which is offered in place. So if you understand that music is required in sixth grade, so they can either fulfill that music requirement with band, choir, or orchestra, or they would fulfill it by taking general music. When working with our music department, we talked about offering general music for a full year, and they just said general music for a full year with students who may not think that music is something for them. That could be a long, long time, and, and I think that we could have some students that would, um, it would be challenging for them to sit there and, and work with music for that long. Seventh grade, we did not make any changes with our applied offerings. You will see that we still offer art, band, choir, computer, French, general music, health, orchestra, physical education, Spanish, and tech ed. And those are all classes that they sign up for with their choices. They get to choose what they want to take, except for physical education. That is a DPI requirement. And then in eighth grade, the only change that we made was previously health education in eighth grade is not a DPI requirement, but we had that as a requirement for all eighth grade students. That is a change that we made, that we made it an elective offering for our students so they can continue to take that class but we are not saying as a middle school that that is something we are requiring for them to take. Um, they, they are required by the DPI to take physical education, but again, this opens them up for more choice for what they would like to choose to take in that eighth grade year, so that opened up um, more offerings for them in that elective block. Questions about either of those slides? <clears throat> Um, I understand your reasoning to set, uh, behind making the health class an elective, but um, isn't eighth grade health when you teach about um, usually typically like sexual intercourse, um, safe sex, that kind of curriculum, isn't that taught in eighth grade? It is taught in eighth grade. It's also taught in ninth grade. In ninth grade, it is a requirement for all students to take it at that time. So those students that would not take it in eighth grade um, they would for sure get that in uh, they would for sure get that in ninth grade so they are required by the DPI to take it in sixth grade so that's a DPI requirement for them to take health in sixth grade and then they also take it in ninth grade is the sixth grade course different than the eighth grade course? yes it is okay I'm only asking that because you know as a, again, as a mother of five daughters, I know that probably in sixth grade we ought to be talking about things that were that years ago we taught in ninth grade or in eighth grade. Um, how how current do you think our sex ed human growth and development classes are? I mean, are we talking to our sixth graders about what Brianna was bringing up? Or, and, and if, if we're not, and then in eighth grade, they have the option to not hear that, and they have to wait until they're freshmen, even though we know that our daughters and sons are doing things much earlier than they have been. How do you feel we are in Holman? Do you think we ought to nudge that, or do you think we're okay? I'm in the classrooms a lot, but for me to, um, 
I don't know that I could give you an answer to yeah, that. That's, that's a it's specific a really answer with, with <laughs> exactly what that curriculum is. I, I know that, that in sixth grade they talk about healthy choices with them, but I would say that in sixth grade they do not get as, um, yeah. I, I, I would venture to say, they don't get as detailed as they kind do in that, that eighth grade I've curriculum. I've taught sixth grade human growth and development, <clears throat> and it's a really cool course and yet I've always kind of thought it's not enough as our society changes you know it's maybe just something to look at as the years go on and and we must have a health yep. um, they're in self-study right, right now too so sorry, what? they're in self-study right now exactly so that will be coming up so yeah that is something that it could I was be just brought gonna up ask if that is in line with either their most current or most recent curriculum study or but if they're in self study then that would be interesting to hear from them too but how they respond my health and physical education department is phenomenal um, mm -hmm. they advocate for kids health they want our kids all to be extremely healthy um, and and so I, I think that that they would say that eighth grade health is very important for all students um, Again, I come back to, um, and it's something that I say to our parents and to our students continually, I think that it is so important and we, we cannot put enough emphasis on that conversation between parents and their children about what they think is important for their children to be in. On the other hand, I have had conversations with, with parents who have said, you know, that they have had those conversations at home and that they feel very confident with those conversations that they've had at home and that that opportunity to take a different class is very appealing to them as well. Um, and so it's, it's information that's, that's always great to get from all of our parents. So speaking of parents, that would be my last question to you is have you communicated this with parents? Have they been involved in your scheduling committee or at any level at this point? I have not had parents involved in, in the scheduling committee. Okay. And parents, I guess just the reason I ask is because the last time we recommended this and this came to the full board, we almost had a line about the door. <laughs> and it was parents, primarily parents who were upset about the band choir thing and that's what prompted that eighth grade study. Mm -hmm. So they began to integrate that into eighth grade. And I think I'm glad to see that this is moving along because I, all the discussion we've had about choices and those kinds of things, I think we really have to focus on student learning and the, the, the core standards and those sorts of things. And it's always, as was said earlier, it's very difficult sometimes to make these decisions. But we may see that and be prepared for that. But um, I have had. I apologize, sorry. I was going to say this isn't up for vote this evening, and, and really it's just an informational. Right. This, this is intended to be informational for the board and, um, and not <clears throat> at this point not planned for action. I have had, um, I have had our band, choir, orchestra, um, teachers all in the same room talking, talking about these things and talking about this schedule, and um, they're very positive about it they are they're excited about that opportunity um, to be with their kids well I believe it's going to be go without one or two comments and that's to be expected but thank you very much we always welcome the difficult questions that's what's gonna make us better thank you or you'll have it on the next slide yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey this is my closing all right um, you know just just very quickly you've heard me talk about the Common Core many times um, you know, the Common Core is driving what we are doing in, in education right now, and, and I think that this is putting us um, in the driver's seat when we're looking at attacking the Common Core. I think that this also comes back to the middle school philosophy and something that, that I am passionate about, about offering our kids those opportunities and, and working with our kids to offer them that exposure. Um, and also just to, as I've talked about with, with difficult questions, just a continual challenge to always improve. Um, you know, you may, you may see me right back here next year when our staff says, we know what we can do even better. And I think that, that we, can't, we can't put our feet in the cement and just decide that's where we're going to stay. We have to continually keep moving and try and improve to make ourselves better. Um, I just have to put a huge thank you out there to, to my entire staff 
Um, from top to bottom, I, I will put my staff up, up with anybody. They work so hard and they have embraced this change and they've worked really hard to do what's best for kids. And, and this wasn't me. This was just me tonight in a presentation, but this is, this is about them and the body of work that they put together. Um, I'm very proud of everything that they did. And that just leads into our school. I have a great amount of pride for our school. Um, stop by anytime because it's amazing what we have going on in our classrooms and and it's it's going to start to show and it already does show but we have amazing staff we have amazing students and um we're we're we're, we're set to do some great things so do you have any questions i did still have just one i thank you to you and, and all the teachers i think there's a lot of great changes potentially um my question goes back to brianna's comment in not necessarily the human growth and development part of health, but every part of the curriculum in health. And do you feel there's going to be any disadvantages for students to hear and to take that at different times? Not, not necessarily that they won't get the education, but that they are learning it and getting it at different grades, if, if you know what I mean. Yes, I think that does create challenges. Um, I, I think that that is something that I will have to work with our health department on to, to figure out how can we work with getting this information to students and then those students that that may be at a little bit of a different level um, when they get to high school and and they have had that information so I think that 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 could be a challenge um, that we may have so yes I agree that that could be a challenge I think that it's one that that we need to sit down and have conversations about just a big concern mm -hmm. I think too not necessarily a question but a comment is that sorry about that we are in times that are so different than they were 10 years ago and and I commend you for grappling with those issues it's not an easy thing it's not going to be done in one year but our kids are way different than they were aren't they than they were 10 years ago decades ago and we need to address those issues, whether it's human growth, whether it's band, whatever. And um, thank you for being willing, you know, to talk about that because it isn't easy. <laughs> it's not easy, and there's so many differing opinions. But um, I do think that's what uh, that's what I love about Holman. We don't skirt those issues. We attack them. We figure them out. So thank you, Ryan for what you're doing and your staff, Wendy, you as well. Um, yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thank you. Okay, thank you. Then moving on to business services, audit services bid, Mr. Austin. And as Mr. Austin makes his way again, this, we have a couple items here. I've, I've noticed we have some real um, time issues that um, waiting for information. Again, this, what Jason pr presents to you tonight is not up for action tonight that will be coming up the next board meeting I believe um, <coughs> the information has been put on your drop box those of you that are viewing that I think we also included paper copies because again this wasn't prepared for Wednesday it made it soon after Wednesday but uh, anything that does not make it Wednesday to you we always make sure that minimum we have a paper copy for you and and again this is not for action tonight so um, if you don't have questions when Jason's done be sure to forward those to us and we will get a response to you I tell you I'm on a tough spot on the agenda no matter what I used to be on the end of the agenda and now I follow presentations like mr. Vogler's I I can't win but I am pleased to present information on the audit services bid tonight um, this is one of two big bids that we are undertaking in the business service department um, this is a bid that we typically bid on a five-year cycle. Um, the bids were accepted, uh, solicited and accepted until January 31st. We received three proposals. Um, we, we published four notices. We, we listed the bid on the website and then we also sent out requests to uh, many of the regional firms as well. So we really uh, got aggressive and we were soliciting as many bids as possible. But uh, we received three proposals all which included technical and cost bids. The proposals have been evaluated and w we conducted some further interviews and also checked references as well and that's partly the delay in not having this into the 
uh, board packets in a timely manner. Um, you know, being that we just finished those bids on the 31st, going through these multiple bids, going through all the specs and whatnot, making sure that they met those requirements is, is definitely time consuming to say the least. Um, each of the firm's technical proposals met the, the requirements, so the firm with the most competitive bid is being re recommended to you folks tonight. Um, I will share with you that you know the total contract for the 2013-17 is a firm bid, a maximum price bid of $52,000. And the issue paper uh, identifies the annual cost of those services each and every year. Some of you may ask, well, what was our current cost this year for audit services? Our current cost this year was $10,250. So the proposal in the first year for next year would be $9,800. So a little bit of savings right off the bat for next year's audit services. So a total recommendation or a total bid of $52,000 for this. It will require us to switch auditing firms. We have been with Tostrud & Temp um, prior to even 96, 1996. So we've been with Tostrud and Temp for a very, very long time. Uh, Tostrud and Temp, I can't say enough about, you know, the high level of service they provided. They were very professional. They were very efficient. Uh, their courtesy that they afforded to our staff and working in the, with our staff and performing that audit, um, just a top-notch firm. But their firm wasn't, or their bid wasn't quite as competitive as this other firm. The other firm is a local firm they do have an office in Holman as well so the new audit firm that I'm recommending is Ingelson and Associates for 2013 to 2017 this is something I'm asking for uh, your approval on February 25th 2013 so when you say that the the maximums per year the amounts here are per year maximums. Usually when auditing firms, when there's a change, a lot of times that first year, there's a lot more work that goes into that first year. And um, I've seen where firms have been charged extra for those. So what you're saying is the contract we have is saying it's 9,800 period, wham, bam, no matter how much work they do. That is correct. That is correct. Anything that has to do with the audit related services would be included in that price. So that's how we re wrote it into the specs and, and they agreed to that and we, um, they responded to that. They responded to the terms of um, our proposal and so very good question though. Is it pretty much the same contract as, as you signed with the, the previous people? That would be correct. And do you see any disadvantages switching? I know it's not a huge difference in bid price. Well, we are, um, we've had a relationship with Tostrud and Temp and maybe that's a little bit strong. I mean, they're our auditing firm, so you want them to be subjective. Um, you want them to be critical of what we are providing. We want them to, you know, do a, a very good job in reviewing and testing our level of controls and whatnot. I think they've always done that. Um, I, I believe for the 30, or 30, six hundred dollars is material enough to warrant switching to a a new auditing firm um, and it's not a bad thing mm -hmm. when you have the same firm audit you over and over it's good to sometimes have a different look. yeah a, a new set of eyes would be a good thing not that there won't be some challenges not that there won't be a little bit more critical we may have some issues come up in the management letter that haven't been in there in the past um, you know, I'm willing to accept that. Um, not that I'm uh, won't miss Tostrud and Temp because they're very good people. We've yeah. enjoyed working with those folks. They're um, very, very nice people to work with. So, I like the change. I just wanted to hear your opinion because I felt like you said in the presentation it seemed more hesitant that you've been with them for so long. So I just wanted to hear your opinion. Right. And this comes this comes up at the next meeting for approval. That would be correct. Okay, thank you. And then next on to budget development event finalizing preliminary budget. Okay, on to the 
And I'm just going to make a comment again as Jason goes through this. The intent tonight of this, and he'll repeat this most likely, is that uh, we do have a special meeting scheduled for a week from tonight on budget development. And so this hopefully will be um, helpful to you as we set the stage for next Monday. And Jason will kind of bring us up to speed at this point and then uh, looking ahead to next Monday and kind of set the, the agenda for that. Okay, so the presentation tonight is just to prepare us for the special board workshop that is coming up, uh, as Dr. Carlson said, on the 18th. So the, tonight, the agenda, hopefully make it rather brief, uh, we'll focus on the budget calendar overview. Again, just looking at where we're at currently with that budget development calendar. Of course, this is you know new this year. We've moved some dates around. We've tried to you know involve the leadership team more. We've worked with the board more as well to have a little bit more involved process. So just summarizing that budget calendar and, and the steps where we're currently at. Also remind everybody again the fiscal performance measures which I covered in December. Looking at again the input variables output that was also pre presented in December which will be important for next week's meeting. Just talking about the recommended strategies what we're looking for on the 18th and in the, uh, this week as well, and then wrap it up with a conclusion and possible questions if anybody has them. So budget calendar overview. If you recall, at this stage, we're, we're finalizing the preliminary budget. Our, our goal at this point is to have a preliminary budget approved by the board on the 25th. So in order to do that, we're going to have the special board meeting on the 18th. We're also working with the leadership team this weekend, this week, to look a little bit closer at unfunded, undermet, or unmet and underfunded needs. Also, look at some of the recommended strategies that we have at this point in time for their review and input on those. We got a little bit behind, as you see here on the 28th of January, and on the 11th we were to bring this information to you a little bit earlier. Um, this is a new calendar. We're trying to work the best we can within that. Um, due to some unplanned things, uh, we're now um, playing a little bit of catch up, but I think we'll be back on track if we can approve that preliminary budget on the 25th. Anybody have any questions on this portion of it so far? Um, just to remind you, too, in 2014-15, we're pushing it even further up, making even more changes next year. Um, partly due to you know, creating more involvement for the board and creating more involvement for the leadership team. So we're developing a, a budget that we all um, understand, agree with, and, and really can move forward with for 2014-15 as well. Remember these fiscal performance measures. I talked about these in December, gave you an update on these. Based on that initial budget output, um, looking at such things as comparative per pupil expenditures, that gross school tax rate. Remember, whatever budget we approve will eventually end in a mill rate and you know presentation in the fall to the board and the taxpayers and setting that final mill rate. So keeping in mind, what is our gross school tax rate with this budget and based on the assumptions that we have and the decisions we're going to make? Is that gross school tax rate going to be something we can accept? Do we need to look at ways to, to minimize that and so on and so forth. Always keeping in mind fund balance and other important fiscal performance measures that do impact or are the result of this, the decisions we make in budgeting and expenditures and so on and so forth. Initial budget output. Remember our ending fund balance at this point in time is anticipated to increase. The general fund revenue for next year is going to be upwards of $41.3 million. The general fund expenditures slightly higher, creating an ending fund balance, a reduction in ending fund balance, a slight deficit of roughly $4,800. But remember, much of this budget is based on a cast forward methodology. We have these input budget variables, the best estimates that we had at um, this stage of, of the game, the budget development process. We also have our one-time allocations from 1213 built into this too. 
So that's part of the work that we're doing as a leadership team is looking at those one-time allocations. Are those going to continue? Are we going to have, are we going to reduce those, repurpose those for ongoing or one, future one-time expenditures as well? And then taking a look at the new on and underfunded needs in addition. It's, it's very helpful to know where we're at before next week's meeting as well. Based on a slight deficit in the fund balance, where does that, that, that how is that attributed? Well, it's, it's attributed to the, um, the operational surplus or deficit. So right now we're, we're operating off about a $62,000 deficit if we don't change anything in our expenditures or our initial budget output. So knowing that we maybe need to make some changes in the one-time allocations um, or, you know, expenditures cutting, uh, cutting expenditures in other ways and, and whatnot. So keeping that in mind, the structural surplus helps offset that. But remember that structural surplus is the sinking fund. And that's our commitment to preserving some of those dollars for future building needs. For Sand Lake, for the high school, and Prairie View as well. So it's important to maintain that commitment to set aside those additional dollars, the $57,000 in that structural surplus. What's important then is to also look at, this is the, the revenue side. And the revenue side's pretty important because right now our assumptions are based on this revenue limit per pupil increasing by $100. Well, that dollar amount won't be confirmed until the biennium budget is released. That dollar amount could be more, it could be less. There's rumors out there that it could be $50, it could be zero. Um, and in addition to that, the membership FTE growth. The initial budget variables included uh, an assumption that we are forecasting our student growth to be 2.76%. Will that materialize? We won't know that until the fall, third Friday count in the fall. So this is the best information we have at this point in time. Uh, the biennium budget hopefully will be released in the next week or, or two weeks. We'll know more information on that. But that could play a big factor in the revenue side of our budget at this point. The initial budget output also, we need to consider the expenditure side. Right now we've got these one-time transactions built in there that are carryover from 12-13. Transportation, buildings and grounds, information technology, instructional services, those are all things that we're currently working through. Are those going to be ongoing allocations? Are those going to be just the one-time allocations like we had in 12-13? Really looking at these dollar amounts and possibly repurposing some of those. How much of this is available for repurposing? That's important too, and that's going to come out um, during that meeting on the 18th as well. The recommended strategies, like I said, right now we're working with the leadership team this week to go through that. We've had some individual meetings with them over the past week, get their thoughts on things. Um, of course, there's the special board meeting on February 18th, and then we're looking at the board meeting on the 25th for your preliminary budget approval. So a lot of information I, I tried to cover pretty quick, but does anybody have any questions on this and where we're at in this process? Are there any questions? Any information that you might find helpful for the meeting next week related to the budget? <clears throat> I thought I had two, but I have one for sure. One item, I, oh, I do have two. First is the um, building allocation. For I know it's different at each level per student, but can you would you be able to provide for us an explanation of what is the expectation for those dollars to be used for? If it's so, the sorts of things that those dollars go toward, maybe examples, whether it's additional supplies or is it curriculum. Well, curriculum materials usually come out of Wendy's budgets, but if there needs to be supplementary, um, is it technology? Is it 
toilet paper and those kind of things. I'm, if you could just have that, maybe an explanation of that for the board and what goes into making that up. And the second thing I'd like to see, because I know we talk about the deficit and reducing that, but it seems that we have been trending the last few years to have an actual balance and not a deficit at the end of the year. And just for the board, if you could just bring that information of what the last three years year end has been because I if I'm not mistaken we use some of those dollars to do some meet some unmet needs I think either this year or, next year, or are going to use them or, or whatever but it, that would be good information to have I know we're projecting a deficit but we have we tend to project a deficit every year because we are so conservative and then that doesn't always happen and if any of those that balance you know we've said to people if they are given an allocation and they want to save it for over three years in order to do something big in their building you know a lot if any portion of that is for those sorts of long-term things because we wouldn't want to you know endanger their use of that and maybe that doesn't go into the what is the balance at the end of the year but those are just some things I was thinking of as you went through your presentation anything else anyone else can would it help to have that information before the meeting then you know it's you're probably gonna have to explain it anyway so I think if you just bring it for that meeting you can certainly if it's easily easy to send and people want to take a look at it but if you want to just bring it that evening and okay. go through it and not a long discussion but just that information would be helpful to me in looking at things. So any of those, any other of those kinds of things? Okay, Jason, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We will see you next week. And then the next item is the information technology. And Jan uh, You may remember the last board meeting, Jan presented um, to kind of get you ready for tonight that this would be coming. So what you will see is a recommendation for much of putting our wireless infrastructure in place. And so a lot of work has gone into the last couple of weeks. This was a very, again, um, her final um, recommendation uh, was not put together until recent. Um, in fact, last Wednesday, you'll see that they were still conducting final interviews with some of the vendors, even on Wednesday. So. Uh, for that reason, again, this is not an action item for you tonight. <clears throat> so Jan will go through it. I think we have, um, again, just very recently, uh, have we been able to get any of this on the Dropbox it yet? Okay. Dropbox. So for those of you that are using that, but it, we also have paper copies that have been placed in your blue folder. So we, we knew that was going to happen. Um, and so uh, Jan will give us uh, an overview and set us up for your approval next, next time. Good evening. Tonight I am here to communicate the recommendation from myself and the Selection Committee on the Technology Infrastructure Project. The Selection Committee consisted of two Cisco Advanced Engineers, one of whom is a sales engineer that works with a large number of vendors, and the other is an outside uh, consultant who has had many years of experience as an IT director in public K-12 education has in-depth background in network design and support, and who is an objective um, not involved in submitting a uh, response or bid for this RFP. The other selection committee members included members of the INT services team. The goal of the presentation is to cover the uh, key elements of our recommendation. And I just want to remind you that included the network switching infrastructure, the wireless acquisition, wiring access points. And this is for both the middle school and high school. We are also going to talk about the process of selection, the criteria, and our recommendation. I want to reiterate the high level of importance of this decision. All staff and students will be impacted at very high levels. While the RFP focuses on the high school and the middle school specifically, all are affected due to the topology of our network. 
All services emanate from the central hub, which is located at the middle school. All connections, all servers, all applications, and phone services emanate from the core switching infrastructure located at the middle school. The future increasing dependency on reliability and performance of our network, including wireless access for both our staff and our students, the flexibility that will be needed to address smarter balanced online testing and instructional use of the internet compels us to assure that our network is reliable, it performs consistently with speed, security, and is future-proofed for flexibility that must be essential elements in this major network update. Um, High-level criteria were used in, to determine the recommendation that I bring forth. It is cru crucial that we have the right vendors for the project, and I emphasize um, that proven engineering experience is extremely important in this particular update. The specific key criteria that, I, that our team used in selecting um, or, or making our recommendation are listed on this slide. I have calculated that over 200 hours of time has been devoted to the development of the RFP, the, conducting the tours at the middle and the high school, responding to vendor questions, reviews of the responses, face-to-face -face presentations, and then the final selection. I'll go back one, sorry. The process was one that involved five weeks of time, uh, with the RFP being released on January 7th, tours of the middle and the high school on January 11th, and responses submitted to us on January 25th. The RFP was written in a fashion to help us differentiate between vendors who could present a solid and compelling case for their own proposed solution. We did not give the vendors a specific network wireless design. We wanted to weed them out based on their expertise in the design proposal that they submitted. The selection process for the network switch wireless acquisition was a three-tiered selection process. The board has a copy of the original bid summary showing the vendor's names, submitted items, and the bids. The bid that accompanied the vendor's own design ranged from approximately $355,000 to $710,000. And keep in mind that some of the vendors only bid two elements of the RFP. Please keep in mind that the designs proposed, in effect, were rejected. However, we did find four vendors who presented the best design solutions, and they were moved on to tier two of the selection process. The vendors selected to move on to tier two submitted designs that were vetted by Cisco engineers and had met requirements of the RFP. Five vendors were eliminated that failed to meet the expectations of tier one. As you can see on the present slide, Four vendors were able to move on to tier two with their present solution. Four vendors were eliminated based on inadequate design solutions, bidding beyond the SDH allocated budget, failure to respond to certain parts of the RFP, and one was disqualified for not bidding Cisco equipment, which was specified in the RFP. On Wednesday, February 4th, of the, the selection committee spent nine hours hearing the presentations of the top four vendors, asking in-depth questions, discussing the strengths, weaknesses, threats, and opportunities for each of the solutions. Two of the vendors selected for Tier 3 met the criteria and moved on to the final stage. They each demonstrated a very high level, not average, qualifications in terms of the engineering expertise, project management, deployment, and overall potential for success in meeting our district's needs. Both of the top vendors were within 5% on the bid. The selected vendor had the edge in terms of the high-level wireless engineering required to assure success quality and provided the clearest, most in-depth project management and deployment. Sorry. I had advance the slide too soon. <laughs> um, 
To level the playing field for both of the finalists, we gave them our selected network switching and wireless acquisition design in the form of a bill of materials. Each came back with a bid that was carefully reviewed. Both presented bids within 2% of one another in terms of the total cost. The final decision comes down to the vendor who will provide our district with meeting all of the elements of the criteria with the greatest success. NetTech proved themselves to be the maximum at two proves, I'm sorry, proved themselves to the maximum degree to be the best fit for our district for this need. I check references in depth. Wanake School District, Lake Geneva School District, Oregon School District, Janesville School District, and even one business, Organic Valley. Each one of these um, school districts and the business had used NetTech in a comparable project, and each one said nothing but a glowing report on the expertise um, that NetTech demonstrated and the project deployment quality and services. I am recommending that NetTech receive the network infrastructure and wireless acquisition at the price that you see on the screen. The smallest portion of dollars invested from the elements of the RFP is in the wiring of the access points. It is also the element which has the greatest profit margin. I use the criteria of the RFP, including the vendor responses, the solution proposed, and bids. The two top wiring solutions were selected and compared in depth, and it was the cost effectiveness and past experience of the selected vendor that was the basis for the decisions. The two top vendors were about four to $5,000 apart. We chose the less expensive of the option and the vendor with whom we've had extensive past experience. The chosen wiring vendor is not NetTech's subcontractor. NetTech will be willing, is willing to work with our selected vendor to fully complete the project. I am recommending that we award this part of the project to Unique Communications. They have met the full criteria of the RFP and also is the least expensive of the wiring vendors. It is our hope that the board will give final approval for the selection of these two vendors on February 25th, and I'd be glad to take any questions that you have at this time. Any questions? I do. Can you, can you kind of explain the difference in pricing from the original bid to the end pricing and what that encompasses? Yes, you know, this was a rather unique um, RFP in the sense that we were not you know, purchasing buses or a truck or something of that nature where you, you, you are giving out specific uh, requirements on the, on the uh, item that we're bidding. We wanted to make sure that we had the highest level of engineering expertise. When you take 60 some switches out of the high school and then and out of the middle school and you are replacing your core switching environment which is the switches through which everything flows from the middle school out to the rest of the buildings we wanted to make sure that we had the right people um, in terms of engineering expertise so we did not give them a bill of materials we knew what we were looking for in the design but we wanted them to come to the table and prove themselves in, in terms of providing us with a network that would meet our needs. We use that basis for um, filtering, screening out uh, the vendors. We use the, the bids as well. We went through every design step by step to see if the design was a logical, solid, well-founded design that allowed us to have future growth, to have um, meet the needs of the district in terms of the mobile wireless access, and um, that was within our price range. So the first bids that you see are on a design of their own. So the additional 60 sum from NetTech is additional things that we wanted them to do or that we knew we wanted. When we got to the top the two uh, of the, the four selected vendors, 
we gave them the bill of materials. We said, this is our design. We want both of you to, to get parallel, to be on the same level playing field, and give us your price. It was at that point that they both had exactly the same design. So this is a very different approach, I think, to RFPs, but what it does, we know that lots of vendors sell Cisco equipment. However, the defining moment is in and the defining qualities is in the advanced engineering expertise. Do they really um, understand what is the best type of network infrastructure for us in terms of redundancy? And I could go into a lot of the other aspects of this, but it gets rather complicated. Um, the stacking of the switches, the percentage of PoE switches, power over Ethernet switches in our, in our closets. Uh, there's a lot of pieces, and we were looking for them to come to us and show us their expertise in that first bid and response to our questions. Gary? <coughs> the equipment that we currently have and use every day, the switches and routers, et cetera, um, that whole system, is that, is that uh, no value now? No, actually there, um, there are several switches, Cisco switches that have been purchased over the period. We would buy occasionally two or three switches a year. We're talking about 60 switches. There are a good number of the switches that we have that, yes, are going to be uh, commissioned out. They are uh, not compatible. Uh, they are under capacity. They do not support PoE, power over ethernet, ethernet for our wireless environment and they are set beyond seven years old. The typical life of a network switch is about seven years, and they are, many of those are well beyond that. We do have several switches that we're going to repurpose and bring to the elementary schools. Is there anything in our system other than a couple of those that we can use, or is a, you know, any of that equipment have, have any value, or is it gonna be all devaluated and tossed as being obsolete? Well, Every switch that's taken out will be taken a look at and repurposed if we can reuse it. Those that cannot <coughs> will be removed. They're at end of life, basically. And neither one of these contracts deal at all with uh, the new uh, workbooks and notebooks, et cetera, other? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, iPads, any of that? This, this contract has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with mobile That's devices. All this is all the infrastructure pieces behind. Okay. What's behind the wireless and network performance, our but phone will, systems, everything. Will it include the recycling of those switches that are no longer useful? Because isn't that kind of an issue when you some technology equipment that you can't go to landfill has to, something has to happen to them are they going to be responsible then for uh, that was not specific within the RFP uh, we normally recycle through dynamic recycling there's not a charge in fact they by poundage give us a bit of a rebate well that's a good thing yeah <laughs> other questions So if you have questions, it would be helpful. I think they are coming back. Otherwise, it will be back at the next board meeting. Okay, thank you. Are you happy with the bids, Jan? Um, I can honestly say to you that I am 100, no, I am 500% um, <laughs> thrilled with the, the decision to go with NetTech. Um, I feel after having talked to the many IT directors and folks that we are in, on very solid ground and will have the best the best um, that we can bring forward that'll be a very future-proof network so that we can grow. If you decide to go VoIP phones in the future elsewhere, we're gonna be ready, so. Well, thanks, you, good. thanks for all your work. Thank you. Thank you. And then next personnel report, Dr. Carlson. I just wanna make a mention of the personnel report, a specific item on there that you will be asked to consider approval of that report uh, in, as part of the consent agenda. Uh, there are in the personnel report this evening, there are three non-renewal recommendations, teacher recommendations, and I just want to clarify for the board and the public that the, these recommendations are a necessary step that we must take to be in compliance of state statute. Uh, this has happened in the past, on an annual basis. These, uh, these recommendations are 
Um, these non-renewal notices are for people that are limited, more of a limited term basis, and yet uh, by state statute, we do need to go through this process. This is not for performance issues, and I just want to, I, I do that every year just to make, uh, just to clarify for everybody uh, that this is just something that we need to go through with that process. So I wanted to alert you to make sure you knew that that was on the part of the personnel report tonight for consideration for your approval. Thank you, unless you have questions. Thank you. Then I'll call upon board members in order of roll call so they can present any comments or committee <clears throat> reports. Mr. Menninger. Uh, short and sweet tonight. February is a great month to get in the gym. Uh, go home. <laughs> Mrs. Treadway? I have nothing tonight, thank you. Brianna? I do have some exciting reports for you tonight. <laughs> okay, the first one I would like to talk about, um, I met with Mr. Bear today uh, with another student and we talked about um, a couple different issues including um, the possibility of weighted grades um, and for the 4.0 grading scale. And then we also talked about um, getting students involved in more internships throughout the schooling like applying like for example they would take an AP physics class and they would apply that to work within the train company down on the cross um, and those are just some ideas that we discussed as a group um, the next thing I would like to talk to you about our school uh, does this every year and it's a national campaign um, we sell the spread the word to end the word um, t-shirts and it's actually really neat because this year uh, a part of the profit of these t-shirts is going to go sponsor a few special education students to go on a trip to Washington DC which um, this is a once-in-a-lifetime chance for many of them and it's a pretty neat thing so if you would like if you're interested in um, buying a t-shirt they're only five dollars and they're pretty neat they say spread the word to end the word on the front and then they have uh, it's a collage of words on the back that says like acceptance and be a fan of respect so it's pretty neat um, and if you're interested in getting one of those the payments are due by February 15th and you can get that to me or you can give it to um, one of the contact people on the bottom here um, on other reports um, uh, you, I, I know she's come to the school board meetings before, but, and she also emails you, but Gabby Fashionate, she's a very active member within our school district, and I just want to mention this briefly, but she has come up with this awesome idea to get involved in the schools, and um, what she's doing right now, and I'm sure she'll come and talk to you later on about it, but what she's doing right now is she's having a fundraiser at our school to raise money to sponsor children to go to school in places such as Nicaragua so but her ultimate goal with that project and this is really neat is to get all the schools eventually involved to make it kind of an annual program where we would help where the students in the, each building would help to sponsor other students in other schools and that would be a district-wide community service project for the students to do and I just thought that was the neatest thing so I wanted to mention that tonight um, Another thing, um, the, we have a board outreach event scheduled for February 20th. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm still in communications with Mr. Vogler about that. Um, and lastly, but not least, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite things in the entire world, the National <laughs> Issue Day program. And they are having their local competition the, um, Thursday, February 28th, um, from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. and it's open to the public. Um, you get to this they have what's called a soup and a bread bowl <laughs> and they sell soup to raise funds for um, students to compete at the regional uh, state and national levels and um, this is a program that is very close to my heart um, it has really given me a purpose and direction in life so um, I really encourage you to attend it's exciting to see students be so passionate and involved in what they're doing. And you get to uh, witness kids who've made great documentaries about historical topics and um, exhibits and performances and there's websites and papers and it's just an exciting time. So I have a little invitation for you all if you wanna <laughs> find out more information. Um, again, that's February 28th and that's open to the public for everyone to come and enjoy. 
Um, otherwise, that's all I have for reports tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I always enjoy all the good stuff you have going on <laughs> and are reminding us about, so thank you. Mr. Dunlap. And also on February 28th <clears throat> is the spring sports meeting already. Oh, spring that's sports. That's going to happen there. They have the introduction to the new coaches and uh, all the rules, etc. cetera. And uh, in, in roaming around uh, the last couple of weeks, um, I did happen to <laughs> See on the news in one of the in one of the states I was in, and I was Florida, that they spend uh, just under sixty four hundred dollars a year per student, mm -hmm. and they were froze there uh, about five years ago, and they've been trying to get that back up to. So it takes a look at take a look at something like that, and, and just realize how lucky we are, and how much we get to give our kids, and how much how important it is to them. And it was a real topic of conversation down there right now, and uh, I thought it was amazing that. We're at almost eleven thousand or eleven thousand dollars, and they're at sixty-four hundred. Wow! Is that it? That's it. Thanks, Mr. <coughs> Gittins. <laughs> no comments. Mrs. Jagosinski. Um, just a couple of things. I will be um, spending Wednesday, March thirteenth, at WASB Day at the State Capitol, um, hopefully with Kate, yes. and getting to listen and be listened to by our state legislators because, like others sometimes we feel like we're not listened to so maybe they will listen to us as school board members <laughs> so that's on a Wednesday we will be spending the day down there and um, then also on March 21st is the Renaissance dinner at Drugan's and um, I, <laughs> it's never too early to put in a plug for anyone who wants to buy um, tickets to my table I'll wait on you and bring you tips or shrimp or whatever you want to order and it's a really wonderful fundraiser for the Renaissance program at the high school and it's so fun. And you get to watch really excited waiters and waitresses sing to you and do all kinds of goofy tricks for tips to raise money for Renaissance. So if you would like to buy a ticket for the dinner, which also includes rounds of golf in the summer, and I don't know the exact price, I think it was like $20 last year. Um, let me know, Bob. 30? <laughs> All right, that's 30. At your table, maybe, well not yeah. mine. <laughs> Are you putting the administrators on notice that they should have a copy of the school song? They should. Yes, they, and they, <clears throat> yes, they should, because I think last year there was some hesitance <laughs> by some of the administrators to sing the school song. So they have plenty of time to, to learn that, get copies of the lyrics, and get in tune. That's so here. anyhow, that's March 21st, it's a Thursday, and it's really fun. So if anybody would like tickets, there are plenty of waiters and waitresses out there who will be vying to sell you those, but I asked first, remember <laughs> that. So um, I think that's all I have. Okay, and Mrs. Mayor. Um, just, don't you love our board? I love our board. <laughs> I love um, our student representative. The our t shirt is so incredible. If you don't know what that means, I'm just going to say it. It's it's retarded. We have got to stop saying retarded. And this is a t-shirt that bans that. And for only $5, that $5 goes to a cause where we stop saying that. And as parents out there, we raise our sons and daughters to stop it. Just stop it. Um, that's it. Well, thank you. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to go with you on March 13th to Madison because I will be in the Twin Cities for a um, government day in the um, Twin Cities, Minnesota, where the governor there has pledged to put back all but a few million dollars of the cuts that K-12 education received in the last few years. And I think it was $80 million in additional funds to higher education. Um, so I get to go and have the pleasure of listening to that. But just think about that when you go to Madison and, and give them some ideas that they could be doing that sort of thing for give us them too. Ideas. So. <laughs> and, yep. and I also just wanted to acknowledge under kind of good of the order that Mr. Bear has been long working with that gray hair. He's a proud grandpa this weekend, little baby Owen. Congratulations, Mr. Bear. Oh. You're going to love it. I just love it, so um, being a grandparent. Other items under board reports, um, 
we have upcoming board meetings. February 18th is the special board meeting. February 25th is our regular board meeting, March 11th. And then the candidates forum on March 18th, it's Monday, March 18th at seven o'clock. March 25th is our regular board meeting. And April 4th, there is a legislative forum with, run through CESA 4 in West Salem. And then April 8th is our regular board meeting. And then we do have three school board administrative rules and policies for your consideration and discussion. Data management, community staff, student involvement in decision making, and news media serv services at board meetings. So any input, thoughts, discussion for those? Those would be coming to the Personnel and Governance Committee. I just have one question on 84C. We recently had done that in December and approved that and I was just wondering why that was back before the board the news media yes if you look at that policy you will see that it was recently approved 12 17 of 12 yeah. hmm. and I'm just wondering why that would be back before the board we'll follow up on that mr. Miniger okay thank okay. you thank you good catch on that so then moving on if there aren't any other discussions on the other items under can i just clarify it's not that i don't want the news media here i just yep. thought it odd that it's <laughs> yep. back up for so just to thank you there's no misunderstanding there why i'm asking the question <laughs> yep and then consent agenda items so we have a number of items on the consent agenda the personnel report financial claims and accounts the checking account services bid the private school noon transportation contacts which you received information at the last meeting on those last two and then also the WIAA Boys Swimming Cooperative Team Agreement Renewal and Human Resources Handbook Language Revisions that were included. And those are all the round two um, language that you saw in your packet. So I would entertain, unless someone- I'm gonna ask for a holdout on 9.3. 9.3, which is checking account services <coughs> bid. So any others to pull out? Seeing none, then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items with the exception of 9.3. I would so approve. Is there a second? Second. And discussion on those. Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Oppose say, or oppose nay. Motion passes. Then financial claims and accounts. I would entertain a motion to approve item 9.2 financial claims and accounts. So 9.3. I'm sorry, 9.3. Yes, thank you. Is there a motion? So I so move. Is there a second? Second. second. And discussion. And are you just going to abstain? I'm just going to abstain. Yes, that is correct. I'm abstaining from Thank you. So the record can show that I've abstained on 9-3. So, okay, a motion has been made and seconded <clears throat> to approve the checking account services bid as presented. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes with one abstention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Menninger. Then I would um, entertain the executive session. Mrs. Treadway, if you would read that, please. I make a motion to move. I can't even talk to that. I'm sorry. I make a motion to move into executive session. It resolved that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin Statute 9.851C for the purpose of reviewing the district administrator's performance evaluations. Is there a second? And motion has been made and seconded. Would you do the roll call, please, Mrs. Treadway? Anita. Second. Tim Menninger? Yes. Myself, yes. Gary Dunlop? Yes. Joe Gittins? Yes. Joe Hancock? Yes. 